you're listening to the sounds of film and i'm very excited to have on the show today director thomas robson thomas is a prolific norwegian director and producer of many films he produced the well-known worst person in the world which was nominated for an oscar today though we're going to be talking about his amazing documentary aha the movie thomas thank you so much for joining us today on the sounds of film thank you I should mention that this film was recently shown at the Port Jefferson documentary film series and was a huge success. And uh, Thomas, I understand that uh, you yourself have been involved with music through the years, playing it yourself, even doing some film scoring. Can you tell us a little bit about your musical background before we start talking about the movie itself? Yeah, well, uh, I remember wanting to to learn an instrument when I was very young. I wanted to 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 play the drums or when I when I was kind of old enough. Uh, but it never happened. And I remember also then thinking, oh, maybe I could play the guitar. But everything seemed so difficult. And even when I I, I asked someone, but isn't bass easier? And they said, no, you have to learn the guitar first, and then you can play bass. So I felt no, this is this is way too too difficult. Uh, but then punk came, and you could start a band without playing an instrument. So that was my way in. Um, I started singing in a punk band, and then we had we had this organ in the rehearsal room, and I started a little bit on that. And after a while, I, I played a little bit of keyboards, and then with my second band. I bought a synth and then I was suddenly a keyboard player. And in my third band, I only played synth and had a singer. And we were kind of inspired by bands like Suicide and Soft Cell and, mm. and you know, synth bands and especially duos since we were just two ourselves. And, and so this was early eighties and we were kind of, you know, post-punk. Uh, and at the same time, Bridges, was a band that were more freaks, more hippies playing music, very inspired by the Doors. And two of those members were Mags and Paul that later started Aha. And they actually released a self-financed album uh, in um, in uh, the early eighties. And that was, even though the band was not a punk band at all or a post-punk band or anything, they were inspired by the Do Yourself movement so they released that album themselves uh, themselves and then they went to england and at the same time as aha then later broke out and became world famous we stopped playing with my band and yeah. i didn't i didn't touch an instrument for another 19 years actually <laughs> um so yeah so at one point you know uh, Aha and my band had similar uh, inspirations, especially a band like Soft Cell and Echo and the Bunnymen, some of those bands. Why did you stop? Uh, I had my first child, so I had to sell the synth to buy, you know, things for the baby. <laughs> oh, well, I, I guess the main reason was that we didn't get anywhere at that point you know before aha broke it was impossible to get a record deal it was it, you didn't really believe that you could make it in music so after a few years you know you had to, to to start working and i started working in the film business and 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 uh, the singer in my band started going quite often to his girlfriend in switzerland so it you know it took months between each time we met and you know it was hard and, you know, you didn't get booked much and you didn't actually see any future, to be honest. And a few years later, yeah, as, as soon as Aha broke, then we had other bands uh, uh, soon after, like Belcanto uh, that had a breakthrough in, in Belgium and so on. So it did happen, but it did happen a few years later than, than we had the patience to wait for. So you went into the film business and, and you've made all kinds of movies. Um, why did you want to make a movie about AHA? You know, it, it started actually wanting to make a film about uh, the process of a band making a record together. Because when I saw Let It Be, the film about the Beatles when I was only 10 years old, it fascinated me. 
uh, really I, I could see how the music of my heroes were actually made. And it also shocked me because they were arguing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when and when I started making films a few la years later, like when I was around 18, 19, I, I always had this dream of doing that. And I tried with a few different bands. It seemed impossible to do something like that with a harp. And, and also they were, you know, they split up in the early 90s. So they were kind of uh, out of the question for a long while. And then I started doing all kinds of other things. So, so you know. And then the Metallica film came in the early 2000s. And then right. I got inspired again because that film was a, a masterpiece and it reminded me of Let It Be and it reminded me of the desire to make a similar film. And then uh, a few years later, I actually got to know Mags a little bit because he, he was at a couple of premieres of films I did and, and we started emailing a little bit. Uh, he complimented me actually on, on one of the film scores I did. And so we had a little bit of contact. And then AHA had this success again, first with a single analog and then with the album Foot of the Mountain and also the single Foot of the Mountain. And it seemed like they could really kind of be an important band again. So I thought that, you know, uh, now with the 10th album, something really big could happen. So wouldn't it be a good idea to make a film about the pros process behind this anniversary album? So I asked Max and he said that it was a good idea, uh, but only one problem, we're not going to make a 10th album because we're going to yeah. split up. And they did in 2010, they split up. But I, of course, then said, but call me when you get back together again yeah uh, and he said it's never going to happen and then when it actually did happen five years later they forgot to call me uh, so <laughs> they actually made the tent <laughs> album uh but but it was made a little bit like all the previous albums after they got back together again meaning that that songs were recorded separately morton recorded in stockholm and Mags recorded in Oslo and Paul recorded in New York. So it wasn't really, you know, I, I so, you know, when I finally got to, to make the film and we started shooting in 2016, my first question was, you know, are you going back to the studio again to record something and, and to do it together because that would be perfect for the film. And uh, as everyone that has seen the film knows, I get three different answers. One is yes. One is maybe, and one is no. <laughs> so, Thomas, um, why do you have this fascination uh, with films? You, you mentioned Let It Be and the Metallica film. What is it about that genre that really appeals to you? Well, I'm a music nerd and I love music and I have, you know, I have my share of vinyl and CDs and listen to music all the time when I have the chance. and. And if I, I had to choose between bringing five films or, or five records to, to a, an island, I would certainly choose music. And so, of course, then music films is a combination of, of two things I love. So I really love music documentaries and especially those where you can be kind of a fly on the wall and really follow the process. And that's rare. It's, it's you know, most documentaries are more like aha ended up being with interviews and with and with stock footage and all of that and they can be great too i have some favorites you know the clash documentary the ramones documentary eagles lots mm. of great documentaries that also are not based on a pro where you follow a process even the quincy jones yeah. i could mention so many but a, a third documentary that i love that also follows the process is dig about the dandy warhols and the brian Jonestown Massacre, two bands that are competing and, and the director is following them for like seven years or something. Mm -hmm. uh, that's also very fascinating. So, you know, it, because those documentaries kind of, uh, they can tell a story that's not just about music. Uh, you know, when you're a fly on the wall and you just follow a process, it becomes even more also about people. Uh, so I guess I still have to find a way to make that film. <laughs> is it is it fair to say that you are a super fan of AHA? And if so, why? 
Yeah, I am. Yeah, well, uh, you know, the first time I saw them on television, well, the first time I heard about them was that some friends of mine had been to London and they came back and said, you know, these guys are there, they're trying to, to break through, they're saying that they're going to be big. And we had heard that for so many years, different bands singing in English, going over there. And we thought it was a sellout because we sang in Norwegian and, you know, the whole punk ethos. And when we heard about these guys trying to be synth pop uh, stars, we, we just thought it was a ridiculous idea. And they had heard some of the demos and thought they were terrible. <laughs> But then when AHA made their first TV appearance, which you can see on the film, um, I, you know, were very curious. I didn't, they didn't convince me that much, to be honest, that first time. But, you know, Norway really did have nothing. We used to have nil points in Eurovision Song Contest. And we never qualified for the World Cup or barely for the Olympics. You know, we, we, Norway was kind of almost like an underdeveloped country. So we really hoped that, that AHA would make it because we really needed something to be proud of. And me being half, Ita me being half Italian and having family in Italy, I, I always wanted to go there in the summer and, and bring something that I, I could be proud of that was Norwegian, except salmon. So, so when I half finally, finally made that album, and when I heard the sun over shines on TV and hunting high and low, I, you know that's when I realized this band has something that no Norwegian band has ever, ever been near. You know, this is this is world class, and this is going to make it. So I was, I was convinced that they were going to make it when I heard those songs, and when I heard the new version of Take on Me, that was also much more convincing. So then I actually brought that album to my family in Italy and said, this is going to be, you know, this is a band that's going to be world famous. And, and fortunately, it, it actually happened. And I mean, you know, if you listen to the best songs on the first, second or every album, it's just world class music. And, and I never get tired of it, actually. So, Aha, you know, it's one of my favorite bands in the world ever. And you know, is it because I'm Norwegian? I'm not sure. I also love ABBA, they're Swedish, but I also love bands from almost every corner of the world. So so I, I really think AHA is among the best bands and very, very underestimated, undervalued uh, for many reasons, probably because of the looks and because Take On Me is taking all the attention. But you know, I mean, listen to, uh, I, I can give anyone a playlist of 50 AHA songs that are amazing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, I have to say that um, I was not aware before watching your movie of the band's ongoing success through the years, as, especially as a live band uh, and mm -hmm. all the albums that they put out. Um, like a lot of people, I, I knew them for their hit single Take On Me, which you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. Was it important for you to let people like me uh, and, and others who weren't aware that there are major artists and they have been for some time to kind of set the record straight. Definitely. I, I mean, that's, that's the reason in many ways to make the film. I think Aha deserved this. Aha deserved their film. There are so many other bands that have gotten their, their film and, and Aha really deserved it. So that, that was, you know, I started out as a fan, but I also knew that that the band had conflicts, you know. I, uh, you know, there was a book released 20 years ago that that talked a lot about the conflicts, and also in practically every interview after that book came out, it has been mentioned. Uh, but also, you know, when I started filming, I was not sure if they really wanted to talk about it. I was thinking maybe they're true with it. Maybe they decided, okay, let's do the film, but let's not talk about. Uh, our conflicts and let's just focus on the music or whatever but it didn't take long you know I started doing I started with Paul in New York and did the first master interview and I was starting just to talk about you know when did you first discover music in your life and and you know we continued talking and uh, and at one point you know the conflict just came out 
by themselves. I didn't have to ask about it, you know. <laughs> and that happened with with the other two also. They they just feel that they need to talk about what they feel is unfair and why they feel the other two, you know, are not telling the story like it really is and so on. So the story of a high is really the story of three totally different people. And that's uh, that became a very important part of the film, which I also was quite sure that would come out. And that just makes the film more interesting, I think, uh, not being just about the music, but also how hard it is to be in a band or to be in any kind of relation, really. And when you're in a band, you're kind of, it's almost like being in a forced marriage because, mm. <laughs> because when a band, you know, when a band starts, you know, it's not like friends that have been friends for 10 years suddenly decide let's make a band it's often people that don't know each other you know it's because oh do you know a drummer yeah i know this guy from down the right. street and, and let's find a bass player you know and sometimes they even put in ads you know to find musicians and then if you get this big breakthrough and you're suddenly world stars you know it's you have you're stuck with those people for the rest of your life and and that's so that's quite common with bands uh so, um, so uh, yeah, uh, I think well, one of the things I have to give you credit for is it's really hard to, to, to get people to trust you when you're making a movie. I've heard that from so many different documentary filmmakers and mm. they must be sensitive about a lot of this stuff. And yet somehow you earn their trust and uh, they could have bailed out at any minute. I mean, th they're not always coming together to make music. How did you get them? to put their story in your hands and trust you? Well, probably because they knew that I really love the band and that I'm a fan and that's my way in, you know, being a big fan. But, you know, I, 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 if let's say I had kept all the conflicts out, then I guess, then I guess uh, some of the members would dislike the film, but not the same that dislikes it now <laughs> because <laughs> the story of it you know it's impossible you know so it's kind of it's there like the manager said you know the film might seem a little bit you know depressing in some way i i don't I, i'm not sure if that's true but they maybe feel it or some of them feel that the manager certainly feels that the last part is a little bit too depressing but that's their own fault he says you know it's not it's, it's their quotes. It's them saying things. I, I, I haven't forced anyone to say anything, you know. So, so I guess you know, being a fan, and also they are quite honest uh, when they speak about this. Also, uh, also on television. But you know, a film that follows you for such a long time manages maybe to get things, you know, a closer look. And I also brought in a co-director and director of photography and she has a track record of, of getting close to people i mean right she didn't do, she didn't do the interviews but some of the scenes with morton in the car and some scenes in you know hotel rooms and in their in their dressing rooms before the shows it's only her and and each member and that that brings out something you know it's just two people in the room instead of a whole crew so that was also an important part of of uh, of getting their trust. We got to know them so much that we used to see us. You know, we follow them for such a long time. So, One of the uh, things that is so amazing about this movie is that you really do illustrate how one hit song can make all the difference. And in particular, in their case, one hit video with a certain style. And I like how you brought that style into the documentary as well, visually. Um, but there's probably not a group that is more well known for that style. Uh, it had such a big impact on their career. And yet it seems like a mixed blessing in a sense, uh, in the sense yeah. that they, they want to do so many other different musical things. And yet this is what they're most well known for. I mean, I, I guess that happens with some bands. But your your film tells that story so well. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, I guess you know uh, that's. Uh, I, I guess Paul would maybe have preferred that that they um, that their breakthrough happened a little bit slower, 
But on the other hand, maybe they would then just remain more of an indie band. It's it's kind of funny, you know, because because they were not a typical hit maker uh, band. You know, Bridges were, were very special. And even when they traveled to London the first time, they didn't even have choruses in their songs. You know, most songs were, were quite, if not experimental, really weird. And then they, they slowly started realizing that if we're going to, if we're going to make it, if we, if we want to live, you know, if we're going to make a living out of music, we need hits. But I don't think they ever thought they would get a, a, a billboard number one. You know, they were wanted to make it in England. And uh, that's why, why they went to England. I, I guess they thought that making it in America would, would be impossible. But once that happened, of course, that opened a lot of doors, but it kind of also closed a few doors. And and I guess the same thing with Morton. When they when they asked him to join the band, he had really long hair and looked more like a hippie. But when he went to London, he started getting inspired by the new romantics and the post-punk scene and started to you know make his own image. And then they realized, my God, he looks he looks amazing. And 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 our kind of music mixed with his voice really works. And you know, by chance or by luck, they they suddenly had this combination of of uh, people that believed in them, even though it was just one record company, and that made it for them. Uh, and I'm sure they're happy for it uh, economically, you know. But yeah. but of course, it also closed some some doors for them. So it's. Uh, you know, it's something they just have to live with for the rest of their lives. <laughs> well, I have to say, you, you captured a lot of really good moments and just terrific stories in the film. Selfishly, one of my favorite stories, because this is, uh, the radio show is called The Sounds of Film, and we play a lot of film soundtrack music. There's a great story in there. I, I, I was wondering if you could share with our listeners about when AHA uh, recorded a song for a James Bond film, and they got into a little thing with John Barry, uh, that was really interesting to me. Yeah, uh, I, I guess one of the reasons that that Aha made it, which no other uh, Norwegian bands had ever, uh, was how stubborn they they all three were. You know, and in the beginning, I think that was only an advantage. Uh, you know, they never gave up. They really believed that they were good enough to make it. Even so, for every time they got kind of a negative reception that just continued. And, and even, you know, even insisting on releasing a song that, that, that it's not even right English spelling, like take on me. And this kind of stubbornness, you know, continued when they had their breakthrough and was invited to do the James Bond song for the, the film, The Living Daylights. And what they didn't know was that John Barry legendary producer and, and composer had to be credited for the song so in some ways he had to do something with the song even if it came from aha and he started doing arrangements and things that that paul wasn't or the whole band wasn't so happy about so so when when uh, john barry was away they they manipulated the orchestra to play play it like aha wanted it and that really pissed John Barry off. <laughs> and so later, when he met people, he actually called them Nazi Jugends. <laughs> that's, quite, that's quite strong. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 yeah. But I guess this stubbornness was, was important for them, you know, but it has also kind of ruined the band in a way, or not ruined because they are really successful, but it, but it definitely has stopped them from making a really, really great album together, which I and Morton and probably Mags do agree that that would uh, probably bring out the best of AHA, you know, that they were able to, to do this together and not separately, because they are really greater when they do things together. Even if, even if one of them brings let's say a 90% perfect song 
the 10% that the other ones bring. And I mean, Morton's voice in itself is probably more than 10%, but also Mag's ideas. Uh, you know, that's that's how how I think Aha could 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 be really, really, really great again. So that's a pity, but that, I guess I don't know. I was asked somewhere, you know, what could what could make Aha really great again? And I, I guess they would have to be a little bit older, so they forgot about the eighties and forgot about mm -hmm. everything that they argued about uh, in the old days, and just uh, you know, just came together with the music again in in the music. Well, as someone who is a big fan of their music, I, I know it's a lot of hard work to make a movie like this, but it must have been exciting as well. When you look back at this whole experience, to you, what was, what was the most rewarding part of, of the process of making this film for you personally? Well, it, it was fun all the way, actually. I mean, I, 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 I knew before we started that sometimes we would suddenly be told no you can't do an interview today after all and i was pretty aware that probably i wouldn't get them into the studio or get them in the same room to do something with all three together all of that i knew so i wasn't i know i just accepted it and just went on and tried to get uh, the best things i could um it's really hard to, to pick one great moment like that it's uh you know, the most satisfying thing is is probably that the film worked out so good as it has done, even though we didn't manage to make the film we really wanted to. You know, that some of the things we thought maybe would, would be possible to tell only if we got them in the same room and same studio, you know, the fly on the wall thing. That actually comes through even through the interviews and the use of archive material and everything. And I'm I'm really happy that I'm, managed to in the end with the help of the editor and with the help of the co-director to make a film that's just as much about the three members of the band as the band itself yeah i yeah i guess that's what i'm most happy about and also it's funny that so many people like the thing doing this the animation from take on me because when i had that idea i thought maybe it's too obvious maybe it's you know maybe it's <laughs> You know, and 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 if someone, you know, in in this film business, you you get so many reactions and feedback from so many people, and you know, if some TV channel or some person with money had said that's a really cheap idea, I think you should take that out. It might have happened. <laughs> you know, right. It's so easy. It's so easy to you know to be. Yeah, to listen maybe sometimes too much to to people, and and that's something that really everybody loves about the film which so I'm, I'm i'm more happy about the final result than than things that happen during the filming but at the same time of course being there when morton is really tired of his own voice that's a golden moment and uh, you know there are and, and when mags kind of resolves the whole conflict uh, and you know there are there are great moments in the film uh, yeah. Well, I know we have. I, I know we have to wrap this up, but I, I do want to say, after watching the film, I, I found myself running right to Spotify and looking up all the music and making playlists, and um, and I guess that's exactly what you want to happen, uh, and what the guys, I guess, would hope to happen. Um, have you been getting feedback from screenings and and so forth? Do Do you know if this film has had any impact? in terms of uh, people turning to AHA. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, if you look, if you go to social media, you see that in the comments. And I mean, some fans, you know, the, the fans that follow the band around the world, they of course already listen to AHA all the time. And they lo love the film. I, I was nervous that some of them would say, oh, our heroes and you treat them badly. But I, I guess, you know, they, they probably know about conflicts already. So they get even deeper into to the reason for these conflicts. And some people say, oh, I always thought more was the reason. And but but everyone that comments on the film that are, have not followed Aha so closely uh, they say oh i'm gonna listen more to our, my god how many great songs they have even you know only yesterday i read you know one person 
that I know a little bit that that you know he's on Facebook and every film I produce, including the worst person in the world, he kind of hates it and you know always writes how much he hates different films that I've been involved with. Uh, and then suddenly with this film, he he loves it and and he says you know how oh, the film really. You know, you get to know the context, but you also get to know how much great music the band have made, and that's 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 maybe one of you know that's the maybe the most satisfying thing that that people listen more to Aha because they really should you know not because Aha need more money but but just because the world needs to listen to the that great music. Well, Thomas, I, I want to thank you so much for joining us today on the Sounds of Film, and I want to recommend to our listeners that they check out the film, Aha, uh -huh, the movie. Uh, is there a website or any place that you'd like to direct people to uh, to learn more about the film? Uh, there is a website called Aha, uh -huh, the movie com, where uh, you can see where you can, can see the film. In the US, it's still out in some theaters, probably. Uh, it opened, of course, in the beginning of April, so it might not been that many theaters now well, after a month has passed but it's coming out uh now digitally so on on may 10th you can watch it on may 10th you can watch it on itunes apple tv prime video or you can buy it on blu-ray and keep it for the rest of your life and for future generations well, i have a feeling a lot of people are going to be doing that uh, Thomas, it, it was really a pleasure speaking with you, and I hope that maybe in the future we can talk about some of your other movies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.